Spend time with the Voices of Watch Collecting, a blog to watch's team broaches the most important topics in timepiece enthusiasm today. This is the Spending Time Show. To the blog to watch audience, welcome. I am Ariel Adams, and today we have a special interview with designer, also watch designer, Mr. Todd Snyder. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, great to be here, and thanks for having me. So I've been hearing your name for a number of years. I've been shopping in stores that you've been involved with. And then, of course, now you have your own brand. And now we're actually talking. And I've seen, of course, you have such a deep involvement in watches. Do you have to put on a fundamentally different hat when you go ahead and involve yourself with a watch product? Or is it very similar as when you are uh, working on other types of clothing and accessories? Um, initially, I did. It was, it was like when I started designing, it was... Um, very unknown to me and everything's like very microscopic. So it was really hard to see, you know, the watch face and know all the terminology you know, between the crown and, and the case and, you know, what the movement was and, and all of that. It, it, for me at first, I didn't know any of that. Um, and now gosh, it's probably five years in. So I, I'm, I'm still pretty good at it, but the one thing I've learned in doing collaborations just cause I've done quite a few, you know, since going on my own, I really get the joy from working with their experts because, you know, they, they get to explore and you kind of get to see a new side from them, but vice versa, it kind of, I learn something and that's what I really enjoy about, about doing that stuff. I was talking to a couple of people about what to ask you because I am a watch expert, but not a fashion expert. And something that people brought up a couple of times was really interesting to me and that was sort of related to this notion of sustainability which is a hot topic today of course in fashion uh they say that fast fashion is you know wasteful and even though it helps people make uh, a good amount of money each season might not be the best for the world and watches are sort of the definition of slow fashion right uh they're not meant to be disposable they're meant to be timeless i was just wondering what you as not just a designer but a business person learned about your own industry through something like watches, which, uh, like I said, are so different than a lot of the fashion that at least up until, you know, the last year or two uh, was the predominant mover in the industry. Yeah, I mean, especially in menswear, um, you know, I think, guys, we don't have a lot of stuff to adorn our body with, whether it's, you know, jewelry or, and, you know, shoes, earrings, things like that. So watch is kind of like the one thing that a guy is allowed to wear. And I still think, you know, you, you, the smartwatch has been very popular. Obviously we all have iPhones or, or digital, digital phones that tells time. I still think the watch will endure that and, and really kind of always have a place in, in menswear. Cause I do think it's just so steeped menswear in general with all the heritage and, you know, Steve McQueen wearing, watches to Paul Newman to you name it. Um, it's healthy and, you know, I can attest to it, you know, obviously doing the collabs with uh, Timex. There's a consumer out there and, and it's super important, I think, for customers and, and companies to really um, embrace sustainability and think about the planet. And, I, and, you know, it's something we're doing in our company and one, you know, one by looking at different fabrics and different production, where to make it. And that's something we're deep diving into this year. And, and you know, hopefully next year will be a few steps closer. Um, you know, there's degrees and, and all that, which I don't want to bore you with. But, you know, I've always kind of believed in clothes that you're going to have forever. I, I am one that kind of can say, you know, between a watch or a pair of jeans or a style that I design, it's really meant to be timeless. And I, I think that's the neat thing, uh, especially about menswear is you see a lot of people that become collectors and you see a lot of people that, that cherish things that are, you know, from the seventies or what, what have you. And I try to think about things 10 years, 20 years out that you'll still want to wear, or you'll even pass down to your, your kid. Yeah, human beings don't change. Our sense of taste remains the same. So if it looked good 30 years ago, why shouldn't it look good today as well? Exactly, exactly. You've done a number of Timex watches so far. And I believe the first one was when you were still at J Crew. Um, was that the first one? Yeah, that was the very first one. That was, uh, I remember, this is probably in 2007. Um, you know, Mickey Drexler, who's a good friend of mine still, 
we were doing collabs. I mean, I started doing one Red Wing was the first one. And mm. I remember Mickey came to me and said, you know, what else you got? And I said, well, you know, we both kind of looked at each other and we said, what about Timex? And Timex hadn't been touched um, by anyone from the outside world. And I called them and two years later, we ended up doing our first watch. Um, it takes a while to get through to the right person to do it. But then also <laughs> it takes time to design it, but it, it just took off. It became, I mean, I can't remember how many units we sold. It was crazy. Like it, we, it blew our, our minds away and, and we kept doing more collaborations, but Timex, we did the kind of a world war two revival watch. Um, it was a hybrid, um, that we took from a bunch of different military watches, but it truly just sparked an interest. And, um, I think a lot of guys, and I remember being in Tokyo and seeing, you know, guys in Tokyo wearing it. And I was just like, Oh my gosh, it may, and there was no J crew stores there. So it made its way over there. And it kind of became the watch for that, that generation, I would say, especially, you know, how menswear kind of came about, I think in 2008, 2010, it really just blew up. You know, it, it just became what, you know, guys were into it, love talking about it blog started coming up. Everybody just loved talking about menswear. And still today, it's still happening. I remember at the time when I heard about it and the popularity, the thing that occurred to me was that this was a very democratically priced collaboration watch, whereas the environment at the time was basically fashion designer works with ultra high end, you know, luxury watchmaker. You know, it doesn't matter what it was, that item had to be the most expensive in the store. And different designers did it different ways. Ralph Lauren did his complete own thing. Um, you know, you had John Varvatos that did stuff with Ernst Benz. And all of a sudden, you see this collaboration watch, which comes in at a, a price point that no one had considered before. I was just curious, did, did, you all, did you know all that at the time? Were you aware of the competitive landscape? Or was this one of those very fortunate accidents? Definitely knew um, the landscape. I, I always looked at Timex really more for the story and the authenticity. You know, they've been around since, you know, early 1900s. And, you know, especially when you're talking to, about companies and dealing with companies that have been in existence for over, you know, a century, it's pretty impressive. You know, I, I've yeah. worked with a few, you know, L.L. Bean most recently and Champion and it's pretty awesome to think, gosh, a hundred years old that you, you have to get through a lot of recessions and depressions and all that. And you're still standing. It's, it's pretty remarkable. What I loved about Timex was just their authenticity and, and right. their, and I didn't really think so much about the price. The price to me was secondary. Um, I like to play high, low. I like to have things that are, you know, like with the watch, uh, you know, hundred to $200 watch. Um, and you know, we, I've, I did a truck uh, about a year or so ago. Yeah. It was 100, 185,000. Um, but you know, our customer, I've never been snobbish. You know, I, I, I wear Rolexes, I wear vintage Omegas and I wear my Timex. I, I love it. And I think that's what's changed today about menswear. At least my customer really appreciates it's, it's more of a realistic point of view on fashion and, and people that don't take it too seriously, but still just want to look good at the end of the day. When you imagine your customers wearing the watches you design, all the watches you design have um, sort of a vintage casual flair. What do you imagine them doing? Where do you imagine them taking the watches? Obviously you make clothing for all different types of activities. Um, but you know, I think that you have this idea of what the person is doing. Of course, it's a different notion for every watch, but help me, you know, help the audience understand a little bit your sort of how you get inspiration and how you apply that in the product. Like where do these designs actually come from other than you look at, you know, some vintage designs, you see what you like, but tell me how the, cu the customer comes into play. Well, I try to, I think my trick of design is really built around travel and getting myself into a different um, zone or a different place to think differently. And I will take a lot of trips, you know, just for work in general, but I like to think about who's this guy, what's he doing? Um, you know, if my customer were to go to South of France, what's he wearing? You know, so he still looks like himself, but doesn't look like out of place. And I think that there's a trick to that. And when I think about watches, I still have that whenever I do a mood board, for a collection, it's always built around kind of 
five or six pieces. It's always built around a location. Like we're talking about doing next uh, spring, we're doing a, a ghost ranch, um, New Mexico vibe, very um, George O'Keefe. And I always think about what's the watch, what's the car, what's the house, what's the you know art he likes. I try to surround myself with all of those pieces and I try to learn something. I try to reach and do something that, you know, hasn't been done for necessarily for myself and, and, but also think about what I would wear and what makes sense in that setting. You know, it's, it's kind of like going to, you know, a party or something and, and, you know, it's like a casual party and you come in a tuxedo, it's completely from left field. And, you never want to do that and nor do you want to come in wearing flip-flops if it's a it's a formal party so it's kind of having respect for the people around you and knowing where you want to be and what kind of you want to portray for yourself but I kind of extend that into a watch design and really think about the environment and kind of what is the vibe and you know for example we did the liquor store watch that you're wearing which I love um came from it, their vintage and um, I found it um, from a, de- a dealer collector online and you know I paid like a couple hundred bucks for it it didn't work but um, it, <laughs> it had all the right patina and all that and that's where the design started and then as we said you know we're gonna open up the liquor store um, which I had done at, at J crew. I was like, God, this would be such a great watch for it because it's, it's what we're doing to the liquor store is taking something old and make it new again. And we made the liquor store elegant. So if you walk into the store, we have French uh, oak flooring in there that we redid. We did coffered ceilings and painted them a high gloss olive color. And we really kind of just reimagined what it was. We paid respect to the space, but then we wanted to make it a little more luxurious and and that's essentially what we did with the watch is is we took something that was old and dusted it off and put a beautiful olive strap on it and then we added ever so slightly a little bit of gold um not real gold i wish but um having those gold accents you know on the numerals and on the hands just adds a, just the a right touch of elegance and it's really hard with a watch to design because everything is so small but you still want to give attention to each one of those things without ruining it it's there's a delicate balance of of you know the graphic you know the watch face and then the actual numerals that you put on there and how those things they're raised slightly so that it gives a little bit of a dimension to it and then we did a domed crystal um a curl crystal um which really kind of gave it that vintage appeal but it, it you look at it and it's just a very uh, it's it fits well with the liquor store no, I mean, you, you are a master of execution, no doubt. And obviously, it comes from your very honed attention to detail, with, which is exactly what was required to appreciate timepieces. How do you, in uh, the product merchandising overall, help convey to the customer that when you come to appreciate a watch, it really is about, about the details? You know, in the presentation of the product, sometimes you have to make that clear. Maybe people don't think of the same way when they buy a pair of pants or a shirt. Um, is there, is there a strategy in saying, hey, customer with a watch, it's important to look at the details and, and then and only then can you really appreciate it. Is there a strategy that can be applied like that? Well, for us, um, we do a catalog every, uh, just about every month. We do 10 a year. And, you know, obviously the website is a, is a great tool as well. We, we typically do great storytelling through those two mm. channels. Um, obviously we have, two stores that aren't currently open right now, but hopefully we'll reopen soon. Soon. Um, <laughs> but you know, our, our salespeople are great storytellers and, and we really try to flood all of our channels with the information so that the customer can digest it. However they want to digest it, whether they want to do it, you know, through a Instagram feed or they want to do it through walking in a store or, you know, getting our catalog and, and seeing, you know, what, makes it tick, I would say, um, which is something we kind of always joke about. But um, yeah, it's, it's about the storytelling. And then it kind of talks about, we, we love talking about the history and where it came from and meaning the year and, and kind of the, the reason behind it. We, we, what I try to do is I really try telling the story, but almost from a, not quite a aficionado point of view, but really from just a, 
a style point of view and why it's important. Um, and just telling a little chunk of history, a little nugget that the customer can just appreciate. And when they're looking at it, they're like, God, you know, that's even better the, you know, reason to like it. No, I, th- I think it comes through. And again, I've, I've said this lightly, but I really mean it. Your collaborations with Timex are so uniquely satisfying in the space. I mean, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of various different types of collaborations. Some of them just seem like business proposals. Like no one really thought that this made sense for the consumer. And each one of the pieces that you do, you see that, you see that theme. I, I believe that you have a time and a place and a personality and maybe even a scenario in mind. And I think that's very uniquely appealing. And so that does transcend price, right? That, that transcends everything. It's, it's the quality of the item, it's the design, and it's, it's what makes you feel. And today, in, in our environment, you know, you spent so much of your career thinking about nostalgia and retro stuff, but there's so many relevant topics today. What are some of the mental murmurings you've had about where to go next, given the last several months we've had, which have been emotionally uh, extraordinary not just for us Americans, but for the world, it's, it's got to have such a massive impact in, in design and fashion and messaging for, for a decade at least. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's really, um, on one hand, it's really scary what's going on, but on the same token, it's, it's amazing to see what's happening, to see so many people standing up and fighting for what they believe in. And I think that that's always an amazing thing. And in something that we, we try to do and, and, you know, we try to play our part in, in whatever it is. Uh, you know, we last year did a big pride collection with champion that, um, we donated, uh, the proceeds to, and we participated in a, a lot of the, cause it was world pride and obviously being a New York based, company um we really wanted to support it full heartedly and that, that was the first time we've ever done anything like that and and quite frankly it was like the best thing we ever did interesting um and now we're going to anniversary that with a um a watch we're actually doing a timex watch which oh. i don't know if i'm supposed to tell you about but <laughs> um it's coming out soon so i guess i can tell you but it's really awesome we it was one of these things we saw in the archive um, and I've always had my eyes set on it and it's a real interesting dial. It's, it's, you know, slightly transparent. It has different discs that, um, uh, move, uh, to tell time, but as it moves, it, it changes color. So it, it oh, has cool. like almost a rainbow effect and always kind of changing color, which is really interesting. And, and it's done, you know, in an old school way with, you know, the wheels turning and all that, it's not digital. And, um, that I love. And, you know, there's definitely things that we're going to be doing going forward. We donated uh, money with American Eagle to un- NAACP and a, and a few other causes too. I think it's just super important for corporations, people to think, what can I do? Uh, what's my part? And not just to, you know, think I'll do it later. It's, it's really how do you get behind it? And that's something we're actively uh, looking to do. Everyone needs to be part of the conversation is what you're saying. Yeah, hundred percent. It's, it's, it's too important. I have, you know, three daughters now and you know, I, I want, I want a world where, you know, people can feel free, uh, you know, to walk around to, you know, just be human. And it's, it's scary when you hear stories and see things that you're just like, Oh my gosh, that's not right. And I think it's good that people are st- you know, standing up to it. No, abs- absolutely. I, I understand. I, looking at your Instagram page or just seeing, you know, the way you talk about watches, it feels like you get, you know, uh, maybe a little bit more excited about that product category than some other things. Do you, do, you, do you spread the love between all the different items or are watches something that have a particularly uh, special interest for you? Um, watches have a, have a sweet spot for me. I, I, we try to tell stories throughout. Um, Timex and I have been working together for six, seven years now. Um, I mean, this is after J crew. If you count J crew, it's, you know, it's been decades and you were, we're, you know, keep going and we keep creating new items. Um, you know, sometimes we're looking in the archive and sometimes we're, you know, I, I wanted to do a sport watch, more of a maritime watch. And we took a few designs that had already existed, but then kind of tweaked it a bit, did a, um, powder coated case and made it look and it was um, done with uh, Indiglo, which was really awesome. 
and that was a brand new watch. So, I mean, they're looking at old or new, and this was really meant to be, you know, I think we called it uh, maritime sport. Um, it's one of my favorite watches I have. Uh, of course, they're all my favorite, but I find myself wearing that more than, than the others. But yeah, the watches for me, are they're kind of like candy in a way because they're <laughs> small. And the nice thing about Timex is they're not going to break your wallet, and but they look great. And what I really appreciate about what we've done at Timex is we've broken through kind of what you were saying. There was always this, you know, watch snobs that would, you know, well, gosh, a Timex watch, that's not a collectible. Um, where I kind of disagree with that. And I feel like it is a very collectible item. And, and now I'm starting to see Timex in a, in a lot of great retail stores, you know, and, and, um, you know, whether it was, you know, Dover street, I've seen Timex there. I've seen Timex in some pretty amazing retail spaces that you normally wouldn't have seen. And I think that for me was really awesome. And th- those aren't my watches and, and not that I, I need all the credit for that, but it's, it's really just awesome to see a brand like Timex become super relevant and, you know, they believed in me and gave me the chance to do something, uh, with their brand and, and it's been great. And I feel like I'm just a, you know, a cog in the wheel. I'm a, I'm a part of the storytelling piece and I just love doing it. Absolutely. And it it definitely pays off. Um, one last question that I think is of course really important moving forward when it comes to vending these beautiful watches a customer goes to your store or website, you know, having experience with a pair of pants, having experience with shirts and jackets and things like that. They know how to use these things. But watches, uh, as you know, for a lot of consumers are something that have never really been part of their lives, especially a lot of the younger consumers. They didn't grow up with watches. How do you expose them to begin with <clears throat> with watches? Tell them, how do you incorporate this item into your life if you haven't so far? It's, it's a challenge. You have to hook them into being watch people. But is there something that Todd Snyder can do to help facilitate that process so that people not only see the watches on your website, but very realistically know what to do with them? I mean, obviously, you see, you see them for the time, but you and I know we go on the street and there's a lot of people that don't wear watches. How do you get them to be watch people to begin with? Well, I think, you know, getting their attention, first of all, I think uh, making sure that, you know, I just had said earlier, and I think it's really important to kind of um, surround the customer with the ease of buying. And like I said, uh, with the catalog, it does a great job of that. You know, a lot of people love our collaboration with Champion, and that brings a lot of the younger customer um, because Champion's super hot right now with that, that demographic. And the older guys like it because they remember what they were in college and they, and, and all that. So having things that kind of surround the customer that makes them feel, Oh, these guys know what's on trend, um, is important. It's important to always have something that kind of is the next. And I think, you know, for most guys, as they get older, I think they start to think differently. I mean, I know I did and you start to sit at a desk job or, or what, what have you now, you know, as far as working and it's easier to have a watch on your wrist and it's not as impolite to look at your phone. So I think it's really for us, we're not, we're not trying to convert the masses of, you know, 20 somethings to wear a watch. It's really the guys that are into style that are into quality. They're into, you know, just having great taste is our customer. Our customer is a guy who wants to dress better, who wants to, you know, whether it's a watch or whether it's a you know, pair of uh, New Balance sneakers or what have you, we're always trying to make sure we have enough for the guy so he doesn't have to go anywhere else. And, and that's really what kind of I set out to do when I went off on my own was to really be the one-stop shop for the guy. Mm-hmm. So he didn't have to you know, read every single blog and every, you know, every news piece out there to know what's cool. Uh, we wanted to do that editing for them. We wanted to curate that for them so that they could trust us, that we were going to be their eyeballs and man, either manufacture or find things that were going to appeal to them. And I think it's really important, especially how we sell to our customer. It's really that storytelling. It's really kind of just presenting to the customer and saying, look, you don't need to go through, if you went to New Balance, they probably have, you know, 500, 600 shoes on their website. Only about, you know, 10 of them are cool that you would right. want to be like, okay, those, and the same thing with Timex. Timex has thousands of watches on their website. 
we try to do the things that, and we're here to say, that's a cool watch. I mean, there's some others that are very cool on there and, and we can't do them all, but we want to pick the five that the guy should own and is going to own for the next five to 10 years. Well, it's funny you mentioned that. I have to just think of my personal experience. And as a guy, I would prefer to go into a store that has five good options as opposed to going to a department store and it's like a hunt. Most of the stuff in here isn't going to be good, but if you look hard enough and sort through a bunch of shell, you know, like uh, clothing racks, you'll find it. And um, I, I don't know that I, as a guy, want to be in that hunter and gatherer mode when I'm simply looking for clothing. I want to trust that the store knows enough about people like me to say, we don't know your taste, but any one of these is a good option as opposed to, I, you know, I hope you can find the good product challenge because, you know, it's going to be a search in here. Yeah. I mean, it, it's impossible. I mean, it's, it's like buying a car. If, if, you know, you had to build it yourself, cause I obviously did that with a truck. There's so many options at, at some point you just like, I'm never going to be a, you know, a car enthusiast where I'm going to know all the stuff about cars. I'd rather <laughs> go somewhere where it's, this is the car you want. It, this has the best options on it for your money and, and you don't have to dig too far. But I mean, there's always great stuff out there, but we try to be that voice for the guy that you can trust us. You know, when we assort the collection, whether, you know, it's Nike or, or new balance or even Clark's, we're, we're trying to do something that's unique and you're not going to see everybody wearing it. Um, but it's also taking those confusing, um, kind of decisions and, and presenting them to you so you can easily make it yourself and you don't have to, you know, fashion's scary for a lot of men. And I think that's, I learned that early on, uh, you know, women love shopping. They're, they're, they're very good at it. They study their, they're into it and you know, guys are occasional shoppers if at best. So you want to make it easy for them and you want to, I really try to be that, um, the eyeballs for them and that curator that's going to present them. You know what, if you knew nothing else and you walked into a room that people knew what they were talking about, you'd be okay. Like you're not going to be embarrassed at all, you know, from walking into our store and picking out a suit to a tie to a pair of shoes or even a watch. And that works so well uh, for so many consumers. I completely agree with you because that's, that's how I want to shop. You're, I think you're, you're positioning yourself as the consumer, which is the smartest way of doing it. You're saying, you know, how, I don't want to be bombarded by, by, you know, like dead ends. I want any one of these to be sufficient for me. I guess also what I'm hearing for watches is that they come into the environment because they need something, but then because of the way you curate it, you say, oh, by the way, if you didn't know, a watch is part of a complete outfit. And maybe you're not into that today, but you should know that by virtue of these being here, you're not going to look as complete, according to Mr. Snyder, as you might otherwise be, unless you try one of these on as well. Yeah, that's actually a good, um, I, I'm glad you said it, because I think one of the, you know, whether men or women looking at a guy, there's two things they look at to see if the guy has good taste. One is shoes. And the other is a watch. And if you have one of those wrong, you, you fail. Um, oh, yeah. And those are the two pieces. If you nail the shoes and you nail the watch, all of a sudden your stock level goes up with, with you know, <laughs> whoever's checking you out. It's amazing. You can ask anybody. And, and sure yeah. enough, because there, there's indicators. There's these. And, I, and it's funny. I remember when I was younger, um, this um, girl I was dating, her mom, yeah, I was working at a retail store in Iowa. And she said, no, he's good. And she's like, what do you mean? He, well, he has great shoes and he has a nice watch. So, <laughs> um, he's, he's got great taste. And, and that's how a lot of people kind of uh, make their decisions. And, and a watch says a lot about a guy, but shoes equally. Shoes are, and you can have great sneakers. You can have great Birkenstocks. It's not saying you've got to you know, wear tassel loafers you know, to, get, to be you know, a tastemaker. But you know, having the right shoe that completes the outfit and the watch equally as well. I'll, I'll add to that with a little similar story. Um, when I first started traveling to Europe a lot, which I obviously do for the watch industry, um, someone pulled me aside one time. We're in a conversation. They looked at me very sternly and said, do you know that in Europe, in a business meeting, if you do not have a fine mechanical watch, you will simply not be taken you know, seriously in the meeting, which again, in America, we are the country of CEOs. Um, for the longest time, people would make fun of wearing Timexes, right? Um, right. And in other countries, if you didn't show off specifically in the boardroom, 
what kind of a, what kind of a professional work? So in America, a lot of it goes down to dating and being taken seriously in more of a social context. But we, we rarely think of the business side. But in a lot of other places, Europe and Asia, for example, it's crucial in your higher ability or, you know, the sense of professionalism, success you have. So what you're saying globally is actually such a bigger deal than just in America. For sure. I mean, I, I, and, and for me, I got it, you know, my, my dad and my grandfather both were Timex. Um, they were simple people. I grew up in Iowa. Um, so for me, Timex was just, you know, ubiquitous. It, it was a watch and it told time and, um, why spend a ton of money on something that, um, you know, it, it tells time. It's not going to like, you know, wash your car, or, you know, make food or what have you. It's just a time piece. Um, so I always kind of grew up with that perspective. And then when I moved to New York, I was like, what, you know, I didn't even know what a Rolex was. I, I just remember uh, seeing it in a photo shoot on a, on in a magazine and thinking like, God, what is that watch? It's beautiful. And then I fell in love with them and then I got into vintage and, you know, so on and so on. But I never lost that appreciation. I, I like the simplicity. I also like that it is a utilitarian item that, you know, simply tells time and not to, not to take it too seriously. And that's kind of how I am in general. Um, I have, like I said, I have things that are great quality, um, you know, cost me a bit of money that I have, you know, have for a while, but I, I really have always wanted to present things that are affordable, that look good and are really approachable by the average guy. And I think that's what Timex does for me. It really kind of strips down a lot of those things that, you know, I, I think sometimes they're kind of foolish, you know, people spend $600 on an Oxford shirt and it, it makes them cool. I, it doesn't, I, we use the same fabric. We use the same, yeah. you know, um, same mills in the same factories. It's, it's funny, but it's, I've always been about that kind of quality doesn't always have to be expensive. And, um, I just that's, see that's what's it important as, to me. as if you're a guy like us, uh, pretension does not need to be part of the, the choice. You don't need to have that. Some people are looking for that, but you, you're looking for a well-made tool and that's ultimately how you're choosing it. Um, yep. Todd, just let our audience know really quick from your own words where they can go check out uh, some of the Todd Snyder by Timex watches. Well, they can check out uh, the Todd Snyder by Timex watches on toddsnyder.com. T-O-D-D-S-N-Y-D-E-R.com. Um, we also, like I said, we, we do the catalog and we have the stores in New York City, but um, we've really built a huge uh, following in not only the U.S., but in Japan and Europe. So it, it's been a pretty awesome ride. Wonderful. Uh, Mr. Snyder, thank you so much for speaking with myself and the blog to watch audience. I'm very much looking forward to the next Timex watch collaboration. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. All right. Cheers.